acquainted or, or familiar with Bethel Baptist Church was out at Harold Park uh, a year or two ago when the choir from Bethel Baptist came out and uh, helped leading in the, in the singing out there. And I thought to myself, wow, what I wouldn't give to be a part of that church that's doing that kind of music. It was just phenomenal. And uh, Trey and I have uh, kind of gotten acquainted and uh, you are so blessed to have Trey as your minister of music. I, you probably already know that. He's just a, he's just a great guy. In case you haven't noticed uh, this morning, I brought my entourage with me. They're, they're on this third pew back here. My wife, Beth, is in black. She's waving at you. Uh, our two friends, David and, and Brendan Miller, uh, they live in Greenville. And uh, we kind of buddy around together. And then the, the little short one in the middle is uh, my granddaughter, Maylie. And uh, she's in the third grade and nine years old. And I'm so glad that uh, they're here uh, this morning. Uh, what I want to do this morning is I want to take you, you know, we're getting ready to move into uh, Easter season. It's uh, Easter's next Sunday. And uh, this morning what I want to do is I want to begin by taking you to the Garden of Gethsemane and an event that happened there. And I, I, I hope that God allows me to really shine a, a spotlight on Jesus during that event. Not so much on his disciples, but upon Jesus and what was going on. And I hope that you are able, after this message this morning, you're able to have a deeper, more profound understanding of what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're going to begin by uh, letting you see this video clip right now. Try to listen to exactly what Jesus says. My soul is exceeding sorrowful. Join with me in prayer, would you? Father, first of all, I want to thank you for the privilege and the opportunity and the blessing of being able to stand here in this holy place, Father, to proclaim your word, the truths of it. And Father, I pray that right now, through the power of your Holy Spirit, Father, you would calm each of our hearts, that you would help us to put away those things that would serve as an encumbrance to the receiving of your word as we proclaim it from this pulpit. And Father, I pray that as your word goes forth from this place, oh God, that you would give us a deeper understanding and empathy, Father, with what you, in the personhood of your son Jesus, actually went through there in Gethsemane, of the sorrow that was in your heart, of the agony and the reasons for all that. Father, help us to see, for just a brief moment, a reflection in history there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew. We're going to be preaching from Matthew 26, verses 36 through 44. And I'm going to uh, read to you what you've just seen on the screen. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, along with him. And he began to be sorrowful, as he said, sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here 
and keep watch with me? Was he ever needing the companionship of his disciples? Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. My question this morning is, what is this overwhelming sorrow that Jesus is talking about? What is he talking about when he says, my, my soul is sorrowful even to the point of death? What's he getting at? Some have said, well, being the Son of God, he knew what was waiting him. He knew about the physical suffering that was going to take place. He knew about the spirit of side, the thorns on his head, the lashes. He was concerned about the physical suffering. And yet, Christians in this era of time were being fed to wild beasts. They were being thrown into arenas and torn apart by wild beasts. They were being put on stakes covered with pitch and lit on fire to provide light. And yet, history says that as they were marching to their death, they were singing the hymns. There were smiles on their faces. And yet, here's the captain of their faith in the garden, cowering. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. It wasn't the physical suffering that he was concerned about. That's not what was troubling him. What in the world do you think Jesus was in such agony about? What was it that caused the perspiration to turn to droplets of blood falling to the ground? In fact, Luke talks about this in, in uh, the 22nd chapter, verse 44. He says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Do you realize that's the first time Jesus shed his blood for you and me? Right there. The answer to what was causing him such anguish, such sorrow, is highlighted in the scripture. What did he ask to have removed from him? The cup. I proposed to you this morning that it was the contents of the cup that was presenting such a problem for Jesus. He was agonizing about it. He didn't want any part of it. So what was in the cup? Do you have any idea? I'd like to turn this into a dialogic kind of a situation, but I'm not going to. I don't want you to think about that. What was in the cup? He asked his father three times, Lord, Father, would you remove this cup from me? If it's your will, will you remove this cup from me? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. What was it that was in the cup that Jesus wanted no part of, and it wasn't the physical suffering at Calvary? Sin. Pardon? Fear? No, it wasn't fear. You can jot these verses down. I'm going to read them to you. You don't have to look them up. The answer is found in Jeremiah 25, 15, Isaiah 51, 17, and Revelation 14, 10. Jeremiah says, Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of wine of wrath. Isaiah, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath. God's wrath. And Revelation 14, 10. He also will drink the wine of God's wrath 
poured full strength into the cup of his anger. There's absolutely no question in my mind what Jesus was agonizing about. It wasn't what man was getting ready to do to him. It was not what man was getting ready to do to him. It's what his father was getting ready to do to him. The cup of wrath has always been associated with the judgment of God. His father was getting ready to listen to this. His father was getting ready to do to him what will happen to every single individual on planet earth who enters a Christless grave. The wrath of God is what happens when sin is committed. The wrath of God is what happens when sin is committed. God's wrath is God's response to sin. When a sin is committed, it's truly against a holy God. You know, someone tells me, if I ask them, you know, are you saved? Yes. Uh, well, what are you saved from? What do you think they're going to say? What are you saved from? Sin, right? Wrong. <laughs> Sin was never after you. You were saved from God. You were saved from His wrath. <laughs> I remember my mother's wrath when I was 15 years old. She gave me a whooping, okay? And she told me before she did, son, you're going to remember this. And here I am X number of years later, and I can remember what the room looked like. It was dark, and I remember what happened in that room. <laughs> I experienced the wrath of my mother because I had done something to my sister that could have cost her her life. I got mad at her because she broke up one of my model airplanes, Ricky, and I threw a pair of scissors at her. And it wasn't a rounded end, okay? It was one with points on it. And it landed on her left thigh and punctured her leg. She could have bled to death. But the Lord was watching over that situation. And that didn't happen. But I remember my mother's wrath. And uh, the reason for God's wrath is that sin, now catch this, sin demands justice. Sin demands justice. God is a just God. I'll give you a good example of God's justice and of his tolerance for sin. You ready? How many sins did Adam and Eve uh, commit? Just name me two of them. How many sins did Adam and Eve commit? Just one. Boom, you're out of here. Just one. God will not tolerate it. It demands justice. And he told them before they ever ate the fruit, if you do, you're going to die. And they decided to go ahead and do it anyway. God's wrath is not something that you or I can endure. And John talks about it in Revelation 6, 17 when he says, For great is the day of his wrath when it has come, and who shall be able to stand? In other words, you're not going to make it through. You're not going to be able to handle it. And that is what Jesus was dealing with. It had not yet come to him. I don't know about you, but when I know uh, I've got something coming up that, that I don't like, that's going to be misery for me, it's going to be painful for me or whatever, you know, I've got anticipation of that. I, don't, I really don't want to have any part of it. And yet this is what Jesus was de dealing with. And so to understand, to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have to be able to understand God's justice. You have to be able to understand his justice. Justice is really what the gospel is all about. And if you take and boil all of scripture down, that's what it's all about. It's about the justice of God. Justice is the primary reason for the gospel. Bottom line, we know very little about justice in this country and respect it even less. We call it tolerance. You see, when you sin, you're not sinning against some insignificant mayor or some little village somewhere. You're sitting against a holy God, a God of glory, a God of love, who demands, and I don't mean in a, in a dictatorial way, just, it's kind of like uh, Donald Trump. He's president. His presidency demands a certain amount of respect, okay? God demands, he's, he, he deserves the respect of us. So you've sinned against the God of glory, 
whose greatness and goodness and love proves that he's deserving of obedience. And yet, we're disobedient. For example, when God created the sun and put it in its place, what did it do? It obeyed him. When he assigned the stars to the places in the galaxies, uh, what did they do? They obeyed him. When he tells the planets to march in their assigned orbits, what do they do? They obey him. He tells the mountains to be lifted up, the valleys to be made low, and they obey him. He tells the great seas, you can only come this far. Have you ever been to the seashore and wondered why the water didn't come any further than what it does? It was ordained by God. He said to the sea, this is as far as you're going to go and no further. And what do they do? They obey him. And when he says to you and me, come, and we say no. You know, we're defiant. We disobey. Justice demands payment for the sin. That's why God told Adam that when he disobeyed, here's going to be the repercussions. Justice is going to be served. Do you realize that if God is just, now, those pews don't have on seatbelts. If they did, I'd say put them on. <laughs> Do you realize that if God is just, he cannot forgive you? Chew on that for a moment. If God is just, then what is he to do with you? The world will tell you that, you know, you're not, you're not quite that bad. Is he to be nonchalant toward your sin? Is he to turn his head? Is he to look the other way? What is God to do with your sin? Some will tell you that God is a loving God. And he is. There's no doubt about it. Instead of being just with us, he is loving. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? But do you realize the logic of that? If God forgives you instead of judging, then his love becomes unjust. It's an unjust love. Remember this. God will never compromise any. He will never compromise any of his attributes at the expense of another. Okay? He, he will not do that. God does not and will not give love at the expense of justice. Proverbs 17, 15 says, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both like an abomination before the Lord. And yet Paul tells us in Romans 3 that God has justified the wicked. How can God be good and just and forgive me and forgive you? Let me give you an illustration. On Wednesday of this coming week, you come home only to find, uh, and you come home about uh, 7 o'clock in the, in the evening, only to find that your house has been broken into. In the living room are the bodies of your family slaughtered with a knife and with a meat cleaver. And you see the one who has done it is getting up from his last victim and you grab him and you're ready to take the meat cleaver from his hand and do to him what he's done to your family and yet you come to the conclusion this is not right and so you call the police, they arrest him, he goes to jail, his trial comes up, and you're there for the trial. And the judge comes in and reads the charges. And he says to this man, young man, what you have done is wrong. But I want you to know that I'm a loving judge I pardon you. <laughs> what would you do? Has justice been served? Of course not. You'd be out of your mind. You'd be writing your, your politicians. You'd be contacting the newspapers. You'd be telling everybody that you could get a hold of that there's a, there's a judge sitting on the bench that is more vile than the criminals he sets free. 
You see, if God is just, how can he forgive you? You and I who have broken every rule that God has ever written. All of creation cries out for our condemnation. How can the claim of the law be met? And trust me, hear me, it will be met or God is not a God of justice. How can divine justice be satisfied and the wrath of God appeased? How is that possible? I want to read to you something that John Flavel wrote back in the 1600s that is a great illustration to what the answer to that question is. It's an imaginary conversation that takes place between God the Father and God the Son. And God speaks and he begins with these words. My son, here's a company of poor, miserable souls that have utterly undone themselves and now lie open to my justice. Justice demands satisfaction for them or will satisfy itself in the eternal ruin of them. What shall be done for these souls? Son, what shall be done for these souls? And the son speaks and says, Oh, my father, such is my love too. And pity for them. That rather than they shall perish eternally, I will be responsible for them as their surety. Folks, no angel could do that. No man could do that. Only the beloved, begotten Son of God was worthy to step in and take care of that. And I think this is such a great portrayal of the love of the Father and the Son for you who sit on these pews this morning. And I was so impressed with what you did during your prayer time in coming up and taking these names out of this basket. Evangelism is my heartbeat. Every July for the past 17 years, I take a team into Brazil and we go one on one in the streets, in the schools, in the police departments, in the hospitals, wherever the appointments are set, sharing our personal testimony with those individuals and offering them an opportunity to have Jesus do in their heart what he's done in ours. I think this is such a great portrayal of God's love for us and I don't think we fully comprehend God's love. It's hard to understand that God really does love us as much as he says he does. He loved us so much that Jesus went to that tree. And I think one of the most difficult tasks that I have as a believer, and probably for you as well, is to comprehend and fully understand that God of the universe, through His Son and His Son, really loved me. Really loved me. I remember my second year in Brazil. I almost had my life taken from me. And it was God's way of showing me through all that of how much he really did love me, how he preserved my life. God loves us. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and then it reaches the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win his erring child. He reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Oh, the love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forever more endure the saints and angels' song. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were skies of parchment made where every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe a trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky. It's God's love that motivates me to live a righteous life. It's God's love 
for me that makes me turn the channel when Satan puts on that screen something that I don't need to be looking at. It's the love of God that makes me get out and tell others about him. The more you understand what God has done for you in Christ, I want you to catch this. The more you understand what God has done for you in Christ, the more you will give yourself over to him and to doing what he's called you to do. It's his mercy that catapults us from the basket into the culture, into the marketplace, into the classroom. It's that love that we have and that God has looking for us, the reciprocal love that puts us in those places. If you have been changed in your nature, if you have been changed in your nature, you will have new affections and those affections will be toward Christ so that the more you know about Him, the greater your love will become for Him. I want to talk to you for just a moment about your new nature. Those of you who have trusted Christ, do you realize that you have a new nature? Somewhere, someplace this morning, a comment was made that caused me to think about, you know, why do people, why do people who go to church, or better yet, why do some people who profess to be Christians, who are known, so to speak, to be a believer, why do they behave in such a way that so closely resembles <coughs> the lost world? Why do they do that? Well, I'll tell you more about that next Sunday. But uh, I believe it's because they're truly lost. They're truly lost. They've made a mistake somewhere down the road, and I will get more into that next Sunday. Okay? But I want you to think about that new nature. Because when you receive that new nature, it changes your behavior. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he's what? He's a new preacher. And now, back to the conversation with God the Father and God the Son. Jesus speaks to his Father and he says, Bring in all thy bills, that I may see what they owe thee. Lord, bring them all in. Now catch this. Lord, bring them all in, that there may be no after reckonings with them at my hand. Shall thou require it? I will rather, mm, I will rather choose to suffer thy wrath, and that is what was going on in Gethsemane that night. Jesus was struggling over what he was about to experience from his heavenly Father. The wrath of a God that all he had known prior to that was fellowship. John says that he rested his head on God's bosom. He had only known the love of the Father, the fellowship that they shared, and now. He's going to experience the wrath of a holy God, the wrath of his holy father. And that's what was, I don't want to say terrorizing him, yet there was probably some of that going on as well. He says that my hand shall thou require it. I will rather choose to suffer thy wrath than that they should suffer it. Upon me, my father, upon me, be all their debt. Do you realize what Jesus was saying here? He's saying that once he pays the bills, once he pays the bills, there will be no more. Now, I, theologically, I, I, I want you to really get this. Once he pays the bills, there will be no more. I was sharing with a woman somewhere in a waiting room or somewhere, I can't remember where, where it was, who was struggling over God's forgiveness. And so I tried to draw this out for her. And I said, okay, here's when you were born. Here's when you're going to die. We don't know when that is. But here's where, here's where it's going to happen. And right about here is when you repented of your sin and came to Christ. Now, all these little marks right in here. Okay, these are all the sins. And right here is where you are today. There's where you receive Christ. There's where you are today. Here's when you're going to die. The question is, of all these sins, which ones did Jesus forgive? <laughs> That's exactly right, my brother. These, these, and the ones we're going to be committed. And yet so many of us live in bondage over a lack of forgiveness. God has forgiven us 
of every sin we've ever committed, every sin we will ever commit. And that is not one, that is not a license to live any way we want. For the unbeliever, it is, but not for the believer. It's like I said a while ago. He put something on that screen. Satan put something on that TV screen that appeals to my flesh. And yet because of that relationship that I have with my Savior, I'll flip the channel. I'll get rid of it. Because that is not something that's pleasing to my Lord. My nature has changed. So, once the bills have been paid, past sins, gone. Put away. Present sins, put away. Future sins, put away. That's why Jesus could cry out on that cross that day, It is finished! He did it all. He's taken care of everything. It is finished. And he says, I would rather choose. I would rather choose to suffer thy wrath than they should suffer it. Upon me, my father, upon me be all their debt. And when he was hanging on that cross, every sin that has ever been a part or will be a part of Don Beach's life was on him, taking his life. What kind of love for you is this love that Jesus has? He chose the wrath of his father so that you would never, you would never have to experience it. He chose to be crushed by God rather than you. In fact, Psalms 53.10 says, yet it was the will of God to crush him. <laughs> God loves us so much. And that's all that was going on in Gethsemane that night. And so the Father speaks. But, my son, if thou undertake for them, Thou must reckon to pay the last might. Expect no abatements. There's no backing up. You need to count the cost, Jesus. One of the things that I enjoy doing is teaching people how to fly airplanes. And I fly, not real often, but when I'm going from place to place, if I look out ahead of me, and I see those thunder clouds, what have you, gathering out there. I know that if I continue on that path, if there's not an abatement, I have the potential of having that storm, those clouds, tear my airplane to shreds and me along with it. There has to be an abatement. And yet what God was saying is, son, expect no abatement. Jesus knew exactly what he was getting into, and yet he went ahead and did it anyway. He knew there would be no abatement from his father. Is it any wonder the agony that he was experiencing there on that evening in Gethsemane? God the Father speaks next. And listen to his words because they're both frightening and yet joyous. He says, if I spare them, <laughs> that's for me. He spared me. But as a son, if I were to speak these words to my son, he says, if I spare them, I will not spare you. Those who enter a Christless grave, he will not spare you, or he's an unjust God. The son speaks, he says, content, Father. Let it be so. Charge it all upon me. I'm able to discharge it. And though it prove a kind of undoing to me, though it impoverish all my riches, empty all my treasures, yet I'm content to undertake it. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. I want to close with this old Testament story. It takes place in the 22nd chapter of 
Genesis, you're familiar with it. Because it leads up to my message for next Sunday. We're going to be dealing with the resurrection. God, speak to this old man. He's well over a hundred. And you know him by the name of Abraham. God could have chosen and did choose the sentence structure, the words in the order in which they're, they're, they're going to be read to you. I want you to remember that God chose these words in speaking to Abraham. He says to him, he says, take your son, your only son Isaac, your only son Isaac, whom you love, Take your son, your only son, whom you love. And does that not describe the relationship that God had with his precious son, Jesus? Is this a foretelling? Is this, no. Is this a preview of a future event? You bet it is. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. On one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So we all know how the story ends. He takes Isaac. He's about to slaughter him. God stops his hand. The sacrifice is provided in the bush. And the son is spared. Abraham then names this mountain, Mount Jehovah Jireh, the God who sees, the God who provides. It's important that you remember the name of that mountain. The God who sees and provides. So the curtain comes down. And intermission takes place, so to speak. And it lasts for 2,018 years. And I want to give you a little sidebar issue here. To help you understand what's getting ready to happen. In the Jewish faith, in Israel... Sin was seen by the Hebrew mind, the Hebrew people, very much the way you and I see viruses. They're, they just kind of float around out there, okay? And they did not want that sin. They did not want that sin in any shape, form, or fashion entering the temple. And so what they did, <coughs> I'm trying to figure out where that mic is. <clears throat> and so they offered two sacrifices a day, unblemished lambs. One at 9 o'clock in the morning, one at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And it was to be sacrificed in clear view of the temple entrance. Okay? At the temple entrance, there were two huge pillars that were referred to as the legs of God. And between those two pillars hung this veil. It took something like 60 men to take it down and wash it and clean it. It was huge. It was extremely thick. Number one. You find the information regarding what I've just said in Exodus 29, 36. The second issue I want you to be familiar with is the renting of clothes. Does anybody know who Rabbi Greg Hirschberg is? Other than Linda? <laughs> okay. I've got a good friend named uh, Rabbi uh, Greg Hirschberg. I was talking to him about three or four years ago at a time that I had no idea that this had taken place. But his father had just died. And I was asking him, I, I was trying to get some Hebrew information uh, background on, on this event. And he told me that his father had died and that he had rent his clothes. He had torn his clothes as a physical display of the sorrow over the loss of his dad. So you got that information. 2,018 years, the curtain goes up. The final act. Mount Jehovah Jireh is no longer known as Mount Jehovah Jireh. It lost its name during the time of King David. It now goes by another name. It goes by the name of Golgotha. There outside the city gates of Jerusalem hung the unblemished Lamb of God. Jesus was put on that criminal's gibbet at 9 o'clock in the morning. It was located, the cross was located on the north side of the altar in clear view of the temple entrance. At 
3 o'clock, he breathed his last. The sacrificial lamb <coughs> gave up the ghost. Jesus died. We don't know exactly what happened other than the fact that the centurion, the guards, noticed a commotion over at the temple. They looked across, and what they saw was the veil being rent from top to bottom. You've got a Gentile mindset and you've got a Hebrew mindset. The Gentile mindset says that provided you and me entry into the Holy of Holies. Guess what it was for the Hebrew mindset? It was symbolic of God renting his clothes over the death of his son. You see, God had a choice. God had a choice. He could choose his son to experience his wrath, or he could experience, or he could choose you because of your sin and the justice that is demanded for you to experience his wrath. He chose his son. You go free. You're set free. That's why God can forgive you because he has forgiven you through Christ. And I want to remind you that in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Paul writes these words, and this is probably my most favorite passage in all the Bible because it, I call it the great exchange because it tells me who I am and it provides for me the peace of mind in knowing that when I sin, I don't sin the way I did before 1967. Paul says, and he made him who knew no sin. Do you realize that Jesus never experienced sin? He knew, I don't want to say he, he knew nothing about it, but he experientially he knew nothing about it. All he knew was the fellowship and the love of his heavenly Father. And I want you to think of the sin that you committed last night. I want you to think of the sin that you committed yesterday. That passage of scripture says he made him who knew no sin to be sin on your behalf. Do you realize that that sin that you're thinking of right now is what crucified Christ? That's who he became. He became your sin. And that's why God judged him. That's why he experienced God's wrath. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane he knew what was getting ready to happen. Now the second part of that verse is even better than the first. Because here, here's what it says. And he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And I'm here to tell you, theologically, what happened in Calvary, what happened on that cross, Jesus removed that royal robe of righteousness. He laid it aside. And he put on that dirty, nasty, stinking robe of sin that you have worn, that you are wearing, that you will wear. He put that on and God judged him for it. And he didn't pick it back up, that robe of righteousness. Because that robe of righteousness is reserved for you and I to put on when we come to Christ. Do you know that when you come to Christ, he sees you as righteous? And he treats you as such. He treats you as such. When I sin now, I have a sorrowful spirit about it. But I don't have to worry about being judged. It's already been taken care of. God's already taken care of. I can live my life with peace of mind. Knowing that the sins that I have committed have been forgiven. The ones that I commit today are forgiven. The ones that I commit tomorrow are forgiven. I try my best. I do my best not to do them. And God places within me His Holy Spirit that enables me so much of the time to be victorious. And I did do it. I did do it before the Lord. Private joke. 
Just to be transparent. I'm an impatient person. And I was trying to hang some Venetian blinds, some mini blinds yesterday. And I have tried hanging these blinds, these, this type of blind before. <laughs> and I was anticipating the problem I was going to have. And I was sitting in the chair and I reached out and picked them pick up. And as I was walking to, to hang them up, I said to my wife, here are the blinds from hell. <laughs> and her words to me was, before you preach tomorrow, you better be before the Lord. <laughs> so I'm just letting you know that I did that. <laughs> but even that little issue was taken care of at Calvary. And Jesus was anticipating that judgment in Gethsemane. And the good news is we're going to wait till next Sunday when I preach and we're going to be talking about the resurrection. Oh, man. Oh, what a difference. It was the game changer, folks. It's going to be exciting what God does and did through the resurrection. Let me ask you to bow your heads. Father, we thank you. Oh, God. How we bless and praise your name. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for that event in the Garden of Gethsemane. And for us to be able to understand what our Savior was going through on our behalf. Father, it's almost as though he looked down through the corridors of time and saw each and every one of us. And knew that he was getting ready to bear our sin. And the sorrow and the agony that that caused him. Father, how grateful. Lord, we come to you with repentant hearts. We come to you with grateful hearts for what you through Jesus has done for us. And Father, I pray for those that are here this morning. Lord, if there's one here, if there's a single person here, Father, who's never made that life-changing discovery of having a personal relationship with the Lord who did what he did at Calvary, Father, I pray that that might take place today. Lord, we love you, we bless you, and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.